We're going to just start a little series, um, and uh, I'm going to be tag teaming with some other preachers over the next few weeks. But we're going to be talking about a fruitful life, a fruitful life. And uh, we're going to be looking at a text from Second Peter chapter one. And I hadn't really, you know, sometimes there's portions of the scripture that pop out to you. You you haven't really read them before or kind of seen them as an entity by themselves, but. I was just reading the other day, and this really struck me, and I thought, this is a beautiful passage as we get ready for the new year. So I want, I want, to, I want to read it out. Second Peter chapter 3, and we're going to go right through to verse 10. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his glory and goodness. Through these things, he has given us a very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to your goodness knowledge, and to your knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love, For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. If anyone does not have them, they are nearsighted and blind, and they have forgotten that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I mean, it's pretty obvious when I read that passage why it struck out to me at this time of year as we debate whether we're in Christmas or whether in the New Year's. We're obviously heading into the New Year. So uh, it just sticks out to me because it is a passage which has that smell of um, vision for the future, um, resolution, and thinking about how do I, what do I want to do coming into 2020. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it when I saw that everybody talking about this decade has passed already. Oh, no, another, another decade? I didn't even notice that it had come and gone. And uh, on behalf of me, even I had to look at photos to remember all that had happened in 2010s this year. But it's a time, obviously, where we begin to think about and reevaluate and consider what we're going to be able to do moving forward. And of course, there's many things that people choose at this time of year as resolutions. The most popular, like the five top most popular resolutions all have to do with health, all have to do with exercise, eating, and dieting, and so on and so forth. It never changes. It's the same every year. We justify our indulgence in the Christmas season with the promise we're going to do better after we've had that turkey dinner, and uh, it doesn't usually work. Um, anyhow, but, uh, so, so, but when we read here, what we see is that Peter is giving us his list of some of the things that should be a priority or a focus in our lives all the time, not just coming into this year, but all the time. And he gets this from the Lord. This is Jesus speaking through him and, and, and guiding him. And, and when you look at it, you'll see at the very core of it, he, he lists them off specifically. He says, I want you to take extra effort in your lives, just at the very center of this passage, verse 5, to add to your faith, the goodness, and then to goodness, knowledge. And so he lists off six or seven items that we should be focusing on bringing into our lives. And so what we want to do over the next few weeks is actually look specifically at some of those um, elements because, wow, we don't even have to go and find a list, do we? God has given us a list here through Peter of some of the things that as we head into this year, that should be a priority for us to try and gain and to accomplish and to develop and grow in our lives. Peter understands that one of the reasons he wants us to, to really focus on these attributes is because he knows that there are many benefits to them. I was, I was reading the other day about uh, uh, weight loss, and I don't know why I got onto this. I was following a rabbit on the internet, and I ended up in this hole. Um, and uh, they were talking about um, spot exercise. Have you ever heard about spot exercise? Like you just try and exercise. If you've got a big belly, I'm not looking at anybody in particular. Um, but if you have, a, but can you just exercise that 
one location to try and get rid of the weight. And studies show it does, it's impossible. Bad news. You can't exercise one part of your body to reduce the size of it. To reduce the size, you have to diet, exercise, go to sleep on time, change, change what you eat, change your diet, your diet, not diet, but change your diet. Uh, you have to do all these things comprehensively. And every, if anybody knows how it works, when you start to lose weight, you never lose weight in the place that you want to lose weight first. The place that you want to lose weight is always the last place to lose weight, right? Uh, everywhere, like, I'm losing weight on my face. I didn't want to lose weight on my face, so I want to lose somewhere else. So Peter here, he, he gives us this list, and, 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 and he says towards the end of this list, hey, guys, um, I want to tell you that if you focus on these things, it's not so much that you will grow just in these specific areas, but this is going to affect your whole life, right? This is not spot exercise to make you strong in one area. He's saying if you can get all these things going, then it's going to radically change the whole direction of your life. It's going to radically change change your fruitfulness. In fact, he lists there, if you go towards the end of the passage in verse 8, he says, um, if you possess these qualities, which is Tosh talked about, goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, if you possess these qualities uh, in an increasing measure, they will help you. He puts it in a negative, which is really weird. They will keep you from being ineffective or unproductive. Let's put it in the positive. If you keep these qualities, you will become effective and you will become fruitful, okay? So these qualities are given for us to, to really become fruitful in our lives. Now, I asked Landry if we had a Jenga set in the, in, in the, in the house, and he said we do. The youth had a, a, a medium-sized one here. Um, so I'm just going to do a little bit of Jenga uh, for you, and um, you can just watch and enjoy this. It's going to be so stimulating. Um, but I want to just go through the list and explain basically how it works for Peter. So he starts off, and they're going to use this as the starting blocks. He starts off by saying, okay, this is, this is the way to become fruitful in your life. This is the way to become effective in your spiritual walk and in your faith in Jesus Christ, to make a difference in the world and, and for your life. We're not spot. We're not trying to train one thing and get better in one area. This is just going to affect all that you do, everything you do. So he says, first of all, the first thing you start with is faith. And we're going to talk about that today. That's the main one we're going to focus on today. He says, the foundation of your spiritual maturity, your spiritual life, is this gift that you've been given called faith. That's where you start. And then he says, on that, I want you to add certain things. So he talks about what are they? I think I haven't got my Bible right here, but I think one of them is goodness. Is that right? And one of them is self-control. Is that right? And another one is uh, perseverance, I believe, is one of them. And the other one that's in that same category is... Um, I better have a look and see exactly what that is. Uh, Self-control, perseverance, knowledge is the other one. So these are four ones that, that are almost like disciplines. They're almost like spiritual disciplines. So we're going to take some time in the next few weeks to look at those specific ones, what that looks like in our lives. But he says, start with the foundation of faith, and then on your faith, add or develop or work at your self-discipline, work at your... Um, Godly goodness, work at your moral character, work at your knowledge in Christ and your understanding of Christ. Work at these four things. And then he says, and then he goes on to the next one. He says, and these will produce or these will or add on to another factor, which is going to be, I'm going to hold these three up, which is going to be godliness. And this is really key. Starting with faith, if you practice spiritual disciplines in these four areas, the next thing that's going to happen is you're going to become more godly. What the word godly means here is not so much um, somebody that you, people look at and think, oh, you're really moral, you're really like a really holy person. Godliness here means somebody who's in tune with God. If you start with faith and you live a disciplined Christian life, your ability to hear God, walk with God, know God, be intimate God, to be a... Abraham was a godly person, not so much of his character, but because of his relationship with God. He walked with God. And so what, the, what, what Peter is saying to us is, listen, I want you to become a people, to become fruitful and effective in your lives. You need to become a people where God is close to you and you are close to God. Didn't you love it how Pastor Landry came up in here and just gave a word? A vision, a picture of a, a forest. Wasn't that beautiful? 
And you mean, well, how does that happen? That happens by, by walking in these things and drawing closer to God. These things help you draw closer to God. And when you draw closer to God, it's amazing. God begins to talk. But God begins to speak in your life. God begins to lead you and guide you. So Peter's saying, I want you to be fruitful and effective. And to be fruitful and effective, my goal is to train you and help you grow, not for the purpose of becoming a more moral person, but becoming a person who's closer to the Almighty. Becoming a person who hears God's voice and work with God. So that's the next layer here. And now here. And then he goes on, and the last two, and the last two he says, for a person who walks with God, for a person who's close with God and knows God's heart, they will then produce two other things, which is charity and um, brotherly kindness, the two kinds of love, Philadelphia love and agape love, the love of God and the love for each other. So basically, this is what is an effective person, isn't it? An effective person in the kingdom of God is not a person who is religious. An effective person in the kingdom of God is somebody who demonstrates... I might need that gum. That's not going to last very long. I'm just going to leave it for a few seconds. Somebody who demonstrates the love of God. And so to become effective... And to become fruitful in our lives. What is Peter wanting us to happen? What does he mean by that? He means, I want you to become people. If you, if you put some effort in here, you have the potential to become a people who walk with God. And in because you walk with God, your ability to flow in love and, and charity and kindness towards others will be unlocked. How many of you know that when you're close to God, and when you're walking in the peace of God and the grace of God, you're just more alert and aware to the needs of people around you. Right? How many know when you're walking in sin and you're just not, not on track, you're just a grumpy, horrible person to be around? Anybody? Your neighbor can put your hand out for you. They just know, yeah, that is absolutely true. But when you're walking with God, when, you are, when, you are, when these foundational things are in place, you're walking with self-control, you're walking with these other disciplines in your Christian life, and, and you're grow, focusing on those things, they bring you into a closer relationship with God. And the byproduct of a close relationship with God is a growth in love. And when you look in the world, those believers who have done amazing works for Jesus Christ, preaching the gospel, but not just preaching the gospel, but demonstrating the gospel through their lives and their loves for the neighbors and people around them. I, I was just looking at a neighbor down our street called Judy. She's a Christian woman. She's an amazing woman. She knows everybody on the street. I said, Lord, I, I need to be like her. She's amazing. She, she knows everybody, people even, who don't really even speak English. She knows them. She knows their life story. She knows what's going on in their home. And she's not a busybody. She's not like out there just watching through the curtains to see what's happening. She's genuinely out there as an example of Christ. So that, that woman walks in love. She demonstrates the love of God. I want to be a person like that. More and more, I want to be a person that walks in the love and fruitfulness of Jesus. Can I hear an amen to that? And I think as we think of 2020, for those of us in Christ, you know, Christian maturity, Jesus said, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And, and that word perfection in the, in the Gospels, he's not talking about um, attaining to some really, really high standard. He's talking about, the word is actually mature. Be mature. We won't ever be perfect in this world because we live in a sin-filled world. But we are growing from maturity to maturity. And the measure of maturity is going to be the measure of love. It's going to be the measure by which we open our homes up on Christmas, by the, which, the degree which we are able to handle people on the street, by the which, degree which we're able to handle people in the church who make us uncomfortable. This is where Jesus is calling us. He's calling us to be mature as our heavenly Father. For God so loved the world, he wouldn't even spare his own son, but sent him to die for us. And God wants to do that in our lives. So Peter's saying, hey, listen, just, just as you think about objectives in your life, for those of us in Christ, our objective is to become Christ-like. And Christ was love. Christ was grace. And to get there, Peter's saying, I'm going to show you how to do it. Starting with the foundation of faith, build these blocks here, incorporate these things into your life so that it draws you closer to God. And as you walk closely with God, you will see your life begin to walk more in love, more in charity, more in grace, and you will be fruitful for the kingdom of God. Amen. Isn't that exciting? I'm going to leave them down because I'm just I'm not sure how well that's going to last over a period of time. So one of the things he says in verse 8, he says, listen, if you increase in these qualities, 
then you will become effective and, and, and productive through the knowledge that you have in Jesus Christ. And then he says, um, in verse 9, if anyone doesn't have them, they are nearsighted or blind. So basically he's saying that another reason why I want you to focus on these things is because these things help you stop being in honest terms so self-focused. I, um, Emily and I, we finished Christmas Day, and we had, a, we had a very busy December. We had the production, and Emmeline had a big production at her school, and church nonstop, and we had the Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve service was amazing, and, uh, and, and we just had a beautiful time. But we were exhausted Christmas Day. And then Chris Boxing Day, I wanted just to stay home and lie on the couch, meditate, and enjoy the presence of God. Um, but Emily said, hey, we've got some returns to do. Let's go and do returns on Boxing Day. I said, that's a crazy idea doing returns on Boxing Day. No, we're going to do it. And we're going to go to Tawasan Mills. We love Tawasan Mills. That's a great place to shop out there. No one's ever in Tawasan Mills, okay? So we go out there. My goodness, it was a zoo. Um, you couldn't even get it. They actually blocked the parking lot off. They couldn't get any more cars in there. It was just crazy. And I, I, I thought to myself, and I said to Emily, I said, hey, this is crazy, you know? Um, we are such a, a, a consumer society. We've just finished a day where people have given hundreds of dollars worth of gifts to each other, and the next day, the mall is more full than it was the day before. I mean, honestly, there is a, some, speaking truly as, a, as a, a prophet of God, there is something wrong with this. There, there is something wrong with it. it there is, there is a, a consuming, and I, I just, getting away from it, I thought, in our lives, in this world we live in, it, it always is seeking to entice us that peace and prosperity and health all come externally through things. And, 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 and what Peter is saying here is, I want you to, he said, you are narrow, short-sighted. You can't see properly that what you're looking for, I need you by doing these disciplines to change your focus by looking externally or somebody else, if that person could change the way they behave or my spouse could change the way they behave or my boss could change or whatever it is. We are short-sighted because we're seeing that it's all about thinking things will change out there. And Peter's saying, no, I want you to practice these because it gets you looking in here and it gets you looking up there. You know some of the most difficult troubles that you go through the troubles are almost irrelevant. What's relevant is what God is doing on the inside of you. And Peter's saying, listen, I want you to be a people that as you go through life, you are not shallow. Your vision is not, I want you to be a deep people. I want you to be a people that see that these things we go through and life we live is not just about running after things, but it's about developing and growing the inner life. And it's, it's an immature Christian. It's a carnal Christian who has no regard for their inner life, that has no regard for their spirituality, has no regard for their development of godly traits that bring them closer to God, that in turn make them more Christ-like. That's carnal. I'm not calling you to be this. I don't want you to be short-sighted. I don't want you to be carnal-minded. I want you to be a people that... that you focus, as you think about 2020 and your goals, surely at the top of the list of goals will be spiritual goals, internal growth goals, goals that will draw you closer to the Lord. So I just love how he puts that. And then he goes on and says, it will safeguard your spiritual life. Having these, the right goals in your life, the right objectives, the right things you're aiming for, the godly things, they will safeguard you spiritually. Therefore, brothers and sisters, make every effort to conform your, to your calling and election for if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you'll become rich, and you'll be welcomed into the kingdom of God. One of the things I do love about this passage, to encourage us, is that Peter says in verse 8, if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, and that one I go, whew, like you don't have to start with it, and even if you're a 53-year-old pastor, you don't have to be there yet. There is still time <laughs> to get there. I love the idea that he's saying, listen, this is, this is to encourage you to keep going on, not to discourage you. Uh, I don't want you to feel like de a depression or condemnation by not being there. I'm just reminding you this is what the end game is about. This is the goal. This is the, this is, this is the faith. 
and ever increasing. You can, you can grow in this. And I mean, I'll be honest with you, where I'm at at this stage of my life, in my spiritual walk, and in my maturity, and my love for one another people, and whatever, I'm not where I would like to be. I would like to be further up the mountain. Anybody like me? Anybody like to be a little bit further along than you are? Boy, I'd like to be a little bit further than where I am. But you know, um, don't get discouraged. We went, we went for a hike uh, when we camping last summer. And uh, part of the mountain had been washed out by a storm. But we went up anyhow, Emily and myself and, and Nathaniel and uh, Acacia. So Emily said, let's go. So I just, I just, I was doing, I was, I was just doing great. Um, at least in my mind, I was doing great. Uh, we were going up the mountain and, and, you know, I just got into a rhythm and I would just look at a point further up and just keep my eyes on that point. You know what it's like and just, you don't take, don't look behind, don't look sideways, just stay on that point, you know. Or another trick is to not look up, stay down and then look up and go, wow, look how far I've come. So we're doing really well. We, we got quite high and the, the storm had come through, so a lot of the trail had logs over it, trees had fallen down over it, but we did it, we kept on going up, and I was huffing and puffing, and um, we got to a vantage point, and we looked at everything, and said, oh, this is so good, and yes, we've done so well, and praise God, this is awesome, and yes, Mount Everest, here we come. And then we, it was a pretty rough trail, and there was a lot of logs falling down, but then we heard this noise of laughter and cheering coming up the trail, and we thought, you know, we were all sweating. We thought, what is this? Well, around the corner comes two young families, two burly guys with tattoos, their, their lovely young wives, and a whole bunch of toddlers. And they were howling with laughter, and they had two old-fashioned push chairs, prams, strollers. Thank you. Three, third time lucky, if you don't know what those words are. Stroller, okay? Not the modern aluminum kind that float and a Bluetooth connected. No, I'm talking old school kind where the wheels hardly move. And they were coming up the hill, and they had a whole bunch of toddlers with them, and they were howling with laughter, not a single sweat. They had babies on their heads, babies around their arms, pushing the stroller. Hey, how you guys doing? Just cruising along. And we were sweating, and we were puffing away. And I thought, this is so discouraging. <laughs> this is so discouraging, seeing these people come up this mountain, right? But it's not a race, is it, in this Christian life? Some, some people excel and just do really take off. Others of us, just, just takes a while to get it. But, but Peter said, hey, listen, I don't want anybody to stop. And I think there's a danger as you get older in your Christian life. Listen, if you're older, if you're in your 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, don't stop. You, you, you may have reached a plateau, and there's a real danger in the Christian life. Say, well, I've done enough. I'm good where I am. I've reached a certain point. And I, I think as we get older, just speaking to people who are getting older, really careful. Because when you stop, and I say something very drastic here, you die. You have to keep going. When you stop, you, 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 a bitterness can sleep in, a, a comfortability. I love that guy in the Bible. What was his name? He, he, um, he was a friend of Moses, and uh, he went on, and he just... He, Everybody else gave up, but he said, oh, he was an old guy, and he said, no, I'm not stopping. I'm going to take all the land for myself. Caleb, Caleb. He said, I'm, I'm not stopping. I'm, and I, I, I appreciate people like Bruce and Eva Robinson. They never stop. I'm not there. I, I can stop, and I can enjoy how far I've come. But you know what? There's further to go. Am I like Jesus? I am not like Jesus. I've got to get up. I've got to keep going. I've got to keep pressing into where God has called me to be. To get this thing going, to get this thing started, the key thing that God gives us to begin is faith. The foundation, if I take these blocks away, is faith. That's what Peter starts with. He says, add to your faith. So he's meaning that faith is something that is granted to you, that you don't, you don't have to make by yourself. It's given, and then you add to that these other qualities. But everybody is given faith to begin. Because faith is so crucial, right? It's a gift from God. And it's the thing that kickstarts this whole journey. Um, I think one of the big issues, whenever you want to change something in your life, whenever you want to do something different, whether it's a, a, a dietary issue, whether it's a time use issue, whether it's a, a way of thinking, a way of speaking, whatever it is, 
One of, the, one of the first challenges is where do you get that initial spark that brings about the change? You know, I found this in my own life. Dietary is just a very simple ex, uh, example. But you can know that you're not doing well with your diet, but you don't have the spark to make change. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You, 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 just, uh, you, just, you just, I know that I'm not doing, and everybody else is telling me I, I need to change the way I'm doing things, but there's nothing in me that's just like giving me that, 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 you know, like a lawnmower. Some of you have electric lawnmowers. I don't have an electric lawnmower. I have an old lawnmower that I refuse to, well, we had to buy a new one because it rusted out so much it absolutely collapsed. But you just, you know, what is it that, that just gives you that, how, how come sometimes you see people and they are not doing well with their diet and then you meet them a few weeks later and they're looking very different and what was it that just made change? And in your spiritual walk, I think this is a really big question. What is it, what is it that causes people whose whole lives have been focused away from God to suddenly just, in the moment I become hungry, something's kicked, something's sparked that makes them hungry for God and want to pursue God in a new way that they've never done before. I, I, I've been reading about different ways. I read about this guy. Who, I, read, I read these different books over the holidays about di different theories on this. And one guy, <laughs> oh gosh, he said that his principle was that he wanted to get fit, but he, he, he just couldn't get the motivation to do it. So he came up with the small change theory that says you just need to do one small thing, just one and that will be the catalyst for change to take place in your life. So he said, the one thing I did, it was one push-up a day. I think, I don't, no, I'm not with you, buddy. I don't think there's, Landry, I, I, I can't see it. I can't. Here's what, here's what Peter says. In the, in, in the version that we read, he put it this way, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory. I, I want his divine power. So there's a power available to us. And he has given everything we need to live this life. Somebody say amen to that. It's pretty awesome, right? He has given us everything we need to do this, to live this, to carry this out. So I love that. This is not on us. He's done it. And he's given everything we need through our knowledge of Jesus Christ. In the Amplified Version, which just does a good job of it, for his divine power has been bestowed on us absolutely everything necessary for a dynamic spiritual life and godliness through a true and personal knowledge of him, saving faith. Where do we get everything we need? To, to live this life that we want. Hey, so I could never do this. My friend, if you have come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, you have been given everything you need to walk in his divine power and to accomplish it. Boy, I'm getting pumped now. The saving knowledge is a gift. God says faith is a gift from God and because he knows we don't have the ability to pull the string. We don't have the ability to put the gasoline in the tank. We just don't have any of these powers within us. We can do it for small changes, but we're talking about fundamental change here. And God has said, I will do what is necessary. You cannot change yourself. It is the power of Christ that will change you. And I am going to give you the faith that will ignite the, the motor, and you will see the power of God flow through you and change you. A beautiful passage. This gift that comes from a true and personal knowledge. I love the way it says it in the Amplified because it's talking about coming to a, a revelation of who Jesus is. God does it all. We could not do it. We can't find that spark within ourselves to do it. God does it for us. He's done the heavy lifting by the death of his son, Jesus Christ. Through Christ's death, all the work has been done. There's no longer works needed. This stuff that we're going to add on has only been added on. It does not bring salvation. The thing that brings salvation is not your works. It is faith in Jesus Christ. And then the works just build upon that to bring us into maturity. But he's done the heavy lifting. There's no laboring to be, to be accepted by God. His death upon the cross, he did all of it. Every single 
ounce of it, every single part of it. He put the gas in the motor. He got the lawnmower on the lawn. He primed it. He, he did everything. And I think in most cases, he even started the thing for us. He has done it all through the death of Jesus Christ. All any obstacle, your laziness, your, your immaturity, your spiritual dullness, Jesus has taken it all upon the cross and done the work for you to get it started. And then after he'd done that, he just laid it out so clearly. God has made it so simple. It's a simple promise that anybody who calls upon the name of the Lord and believes that Jesus has been granted by the Father power to forgive all sins. Anybody who believes that simple promise, God has made it so easy. A simple promise. Believe in the simple promise. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the answer. Lay hold of him. Even if you have doubts, you don't even have to have the doubts all answered. Just lay hold that Jesus is the promise of the Father. He is the one who will change your life. He is the one who will redeem you. Just lay hold of that simple truth. That's all you have to do. It's like pushing the button on a, on a motor. Brum, bum, 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 bum. So all you have to do is lay hold of it and say, yes, I see it. Jesus is the way. He is the one the Father has sent. Jesus, change me. Oh, my goodness. Is this an incredible gospel? Come on now. How simple is that? It's not even pulling a cord anymore. It's just pushing a button. It's saying, Jesus, I need you. Forgive me. Change me. Fill you with my spirit. Your spirit. Boom. And the power of God, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, will come and dwell in you. And I'm telling you, you've gone from a one-cylinder motor to a six-cylinder, eight-cylinder V8. Something. I don't know my cars. But that's what God has done. Come on now. If you've been touched by the grace of Jesus Christ, you are a radically different person. And you may say, I, I don't always feel that. Yes, you're not always going to feel it. That's why some of these disciplines are here to help, help stir up what is lying inside you. But that's what God has done inside you. Oh, well, The other issue is, of course, with forming new habits and bringing change is the issue of sustainability. They say that, and I think it was Pastor Reg said it's so true, that gymnasiums make most of their money in January over good intentions. People signing up. I know some friends in the church who have done it and never went. They signed up, paid the money for a year, and never went. Free money. We have so many desires to change in our lives, don't we? But we get started, but sustaining it is very, very difficult. That's why... Diets in a bottle are so popular. They always promise you that if you take this pill, you're going to lose weight because people are looking for shortcuts. You don't have to sustain to get there. They don't work. But Jesus, Peter reveals here that Christ, this gift of faith, is not just a gift that gets us started, but it's the gift that sustains us. We never move away from faith. We never move away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. We never move away from the power of God flowing through us, enabling us to do what in the flesh we could never do. 